I am always fascinated by the conversation around golf ball technology development, where it's all headed, this discussion about distance and if it's ruining the game and the sky is falling and all of those things. And whenever we have questions about golf balls, we turn to the rocket scientist in the room. And we met a couple of years ago with uh, Petra Petrich, who is the uh, senior manager of golf ball research and development at Callaway Golf and also our Danica Patrick lookalike. I'm sure she hears yeah. that a few times. Uh, it's good to see you again. It's been a couple of years since we were out in Carlsbad and um, I'm glad to see you're still rolling along, no pun intended. Yeah, I'm, we're really happy um, how things have turned out. Obviously the past year or so has been really challenging across the world, but I think um, we've gotten kind of lucky that golf is a game that can be played outdoors and that people have been interested in doing it um, throughout this pandemic. So we've been very uh, fortunate in being able to stay active and stay involved in work and do all the fun things that we love. So, yeah, I, I know you're not geared necessarily to the sales and marketing side of things. You're making the golf balls, you're doing the science, but were you at all blown away by the demand in 2020 for everything golf? It, 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 was, it was pretty big. And actually it's almost even more impressive now, I think, yeah. because even in 2020, there were still periods where there were like shutdowns. So it was, you know, to some extent, the demand was there, but you couldn't actually get out and use it. And now that things are like reopening and that demand has been kind of built up, um, we're seeing big spikes in demand in terms of product and, um, that affects so many things. It's very interesting to us because that even means like as we're developing new product and trying to scale it up, um, you have to make a certain amount so that when you launch it, there's enough on the shelves. And like that quantity is so much greater that we're having to start even earlier than we normally would to even make enough to get on the shelves for launch. So it's, it's weird because it's pushing all of our timelines actually earlier from a development perspective. We're having to like get into production faster. That is interesting. And I'm also reminded of the huge benefit for Callaway to be doing its golf ball production in the United States and not having to be subject to the whims of tariffs and back and, and uh, jackknifed freighters across canals and all that. Um, what's it been like in your dealing with, with the supply chain side of things? Yeah, it's actually, so it's very interesting. And shipping, I'm not sure, like the whole Suez Canal situation, <laughs> I'm not sure that we've necessarily been directly impacted by that, but shipping in general, even from anywhere overseas has been impacted. And a majority of, I mean, our manufacturing is in the United States um, and a majority of the materials and supply chain that we use is in the United States. And we do that intentionally because obviously it's, easier and quicker to get those supplies when you need them. Um, but even within the US, supply has been challenging. And um, I will I'll even tell you like even things that are extremely important, vaccine development, it actually uses similar ingredients that we use in other parts of the process to the point that we've had shortages on materials that you would never think we would have shortages on. And we're like, why are there shortages looking it up? It's like, oh, the US government has sequestered some amount of material for that. We find out it's related to vaccine development and things like that. So I always joke, you know, like we're using medical device grade technology in our golf ball development. But then when something like this happens, you're like, no, no, we're actually like pulling from the exact same pots of materials that, what you know. Of, what sort of materials would have crossover between golf balls and vaccinations? It's actually, it's the, it's the raw ingredients used in urethane. So urethane is like made from a lot of different materials and those materials can be synthesized into lots of different things. So it's really the like pre-ingredients, um, but obviously when those are being taken to be making other things, they can't be used for things like, and very rightly so, golf balls when we should be making vaccines. So it's, you know, it's like, um, it's things like that, but it's been really interesting and it's had an impact um, I think across the industry we've heard, like across the golf industry specifically, and I've been very proud to work for a team, especially at Callaway, where we've done a very, I think our team internally has done a very good job of prepping for having enough supply, keeping our facility running, being able to like make what we need to make and supply the demand that's coming out of, you know, the game. So um, I think, I think we've done a very 
good job of planning for things like this so that we can hold over as the shortages happen? Well, I, you know, the more that I talk with different folks in the golf industry, the more I'm reminded that nobody saw the demand coming that came in 2020, and it's already ramping up to be very similar for this year. That's wonderful. We all love that. And the other part of that equation is we all want to make sure we have the coolest, the latest, the greatest, and the best stuff for our game. And that's, I know yeah. that's your charge. That's what's on your desk pretty much every yeah. day when it comes to golf balls. So, I am a, a firm, committed uh, follower and user of Chrome Soft Triple Track. I am in love with it. My putter has the triple track on it. I've got the new 10S putter. I've got the whole thing. It all lines up. I have literally no excuses left for missing a putt at any point other than maybe I lined it up incorrectly. Can you speak to what kind of a game changer that Chrome Soft line has been since it developed? Yeah, I think um, I think softball technology has been a game changer in general, um, and I think Chrome Soft is one of you know. So we launched Chrome Soft, the red box ball. You know, we launched that in 2015, um, and it had a huge. It was so. I think you've probably heard. So Callaway Golf has this saying. It came from Ely Callaway himself, the founder of Callaway. It's called DSPD. So that means demonstrably superior, pleasingly different. So you can basically show that 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 it is better. That's the demonstrably superior. It's quantifiable, and then it's different in a way that's unique, but in a positive way. So you don't want it to be like unique and different and like a, uh, but in a wow, I really want to play that. So. I think Chrome Soft in just the feel difference, the wow iron distance, and you get that from the soft, very low spin. So all of a sudden you're getting a lot of great distance. It had this very pleasing and uh, perceivable impact on people's games. And I think what it comes down to in golf is we talk about all these sort of things. Oh, speed and distance and blah, blah, blah. Golf is a game of shooting low scores. That's, that's the name of the game. So we can get very wrapped up into like how to shoot a low score. But the reality is when we launched Crumb Soft and then subsequently relaunched it and the, you know, X and LS balls, what we're aiming for is for people to actually shoot lower scores. And that's the end result of what they were seeing because you get extra distance, which means that you can hit a club that you're more confident in, right? You're hitting your eight iron instead of your seven iron. You're, you know, hitting the green instead of coming up short of the green. We've gotten some, we've done some research around like there's, it's very common, especially for people who are newer to the game and who are learning to miss club. And when they miss club, they typically are miss clubbing themselves short. Mm -hmm. So when you have a ball that's making up that distance or even just, you know, the misidentification of maybe what you should be hitting. Um, it helps you shoot lower scores because obviously like if you're on the green versus off the green, you're probably saving strokes. So there's, I think the, the softball technology, which gives you added distance, I think has a lot of forgiveness in terms of like enjoyability to the game. If you're miss hitting, it doesn't feel like a rock. You're actually able to kind of like, uh, you know, continually enjoy it. I think that's made a big difference for people getting in and enjoying the game. Yeah, and we have this uh, constant conversation slash debate about whether the vast majority of the golf universe needs to have a different golf ball than those who play it for a living, those who are the best sure. in the world, those who could beat us with a butter knife and a pair of rolled up socks. <laughs> for sure, know, yeah. <laughs> super, super good. Um, and so as you're developing product, I, I know this from a consumer standpoint, yeah, I, I get an extra charge, an extra thrill out of knowing that I'm playing the same gear that I've seen mm. on television. I'm not using yeah. it as well. I get that. I, yeah. I would actually be shocked if I was using it as well on a consistent yeah. basis. Yeah. So how do you address that issue in the world of, of research and development where you do want the professionals to be able to play it, but you also want the, the 25 handicap to be able to play it? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that's partially why, you know, so Chrome Soft, when it came out, I think the red box ball made a big splash. But over time, you've seen that we've launched the Chrome Soft X and the Chrome Soft X LS balls. And those have different playability characteristics that are more targeted towards 
the best players in the world, as well as the people who might be really low handicap or playing in amateur tournaments or for money, you know what I mean? They want something that maybe is a little bit more workable in terms of like shot shaping or looking for more specific performance characteristics that, you know, they're not necessarily looking for forgiveness or a masking of the field. They actually want strong feedback when they're making a shot, whether or not it was, you know, a good shot or not. So I think that the entire lineup that we have helps with um, kind of what we, we call it internally like player profiling. So there's this part of the game where it's like, okay, what kind of player are you when it comes down to ball fitting? Um, you know, I want to know like what's happening in your game? How are you playing on course? Where are your pain points? Because some people might have an issue with hitting it straight whereas someone else might have a problem generating spin or something like that. So each ball has characteristics like the X ball spins more than the LS ball. So if you were a high spin player, you're, the way that you swing the club generates a lot of spin, you might be able to use an LS ball, which actually like naturally decreases the spin in your launch characteristics and that kind of overcomes the way that you're swinging hmm. so for even amongst tour players no one tour player is swinging identically which is why we've got the x and the ls for tour players themselves they also have preferences um and i think ultimately another more like concrete way to answer your question is like we have different people designing balls depending on those player profiles and that's partially how we're prioritizing who gets what so the chrome softball would be designed for that player profile that's going to benefit from that technology whereas the x and the ls ball might be designed specifically for the best players in the world and then if you as yourself want to choose to play that go for it, right? Like whether um, or not that helps or not. And you mentioned a concept that I, I think is still pretty pretty new and maybe a little bit foreign to a lot of amateur golfers. Uh, we've gotten them, I think over the last couple of decades, we've finally driven home the importance of being fit for your clubs. Yeah. Um, maybe it's connected to the cost of clubs and why would you spend all that money without making sure you have the right tools in your hands. Yeah. But I don't know that we've come as far in the concept of being fit for your golf ball. Mm, yeah. What does that process look like? Um, I know what it looks like at a professional level because they come out to the, the performance center and they've got all the diagnostic tools and they, mm -hmm. there's no guesswork. But for the average golfer, mm -hmm. do you have some recommendations for how to be best fit to your golf ball. I, I have my personal preference. So there, I have to preface this by saying like, this isn't the official Callaway stance. This is what I, yeah, this is Petra stance. This is what I've seen that has worked. And I think it's, it's also relevant to what the best players in the world do. So you are right. They do come in and they'll go through like a performance center, center fitting. And an amateur can also go do that. There are Callaway performance, you know, fitting centers all over the United States and the world where you could go in and get your clubs fit. Now, out of that, you should be able to see or quantify your launch characteristics. Um, even if you didn't have that, um, what the next steps would be for a, a tour professional is typically we will give them samples of one or two products that they might be interested in playing. So they have a gamer and they have a new prototype or a new ball that they might be trying to fit into. The next step for them would be to take that out on course and potentially play them side by side. So you take them out and, and they would say, okay, maybe instead of playing an actual round, I don't know, I actually did a, a walkthrough one time. So pre-tournaments when the tour players get to a course, like on the Wednesday, Thursday, they don't go through and play a, a practice round as if they're playing Right. Some of them might, but typically what they're doing is they're actually going to specific spots on the hole and actually hitting specific shots that they might be interested in. Like, you know, I hit it from here to there, what happens on the green and they're mapping out the way that they want to play the course. So for a consumer, if you can afford to, or if you can find it, I would recommend get two balls that you're interested in. And I would stick with two if you're going to do this on course. And I would take them out and I would go through 18 holes, but go to the shots that you're thinking. So hit a driver with your one ball, then hit a driver with the next one. Then maybe you go pick it up so that you don't stop the group behind you and you throw them both in the sand, hit them out of the sand onto the green. Okay, now putt with both of them back to back. And as you do that, even for myself, I am not a good golfer. 
in fact, I don't even keep a handicap. Like for me, I'm like, I just enjoy going out and, and practicing. But when I did that back to back with like, for me, like a super soft versus ERC soft or an ERC soft versus a crumb soft. What I walked away with was a ball that I was confident in playing. And I'm like, I like this one. I know that I hit it straight. I know that I feel comfortable with it when I come up on the green or when I'm putting. And I walked away with something that I like I could shoot lower scores with. And that's really the reality of it. I didn't know my launch conditions. I didn't know. Now the tour players will because they have all of that technology. But for an average consumer, I would recommend if you're between two balls or you're wanting to switch, take your gamer and the one that you're interested in, play them on course back to back on various shots that you're concerned about, and it will eventually come out of that practicing. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, I was told years and years ago um, by a gentleman who has spent decades in, in the world of golf ball development, that if you, if you don't have the ability to do that throughout an entire round, at least from a hundred and a quarter in do that with a couple of different balls. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you said, you'll get a feel for how the ball reacts to your swing, to your game and to those conditions. It is uh, interesting to watch uh, tournament week. You're right. And if the, if the players have never been to the course, they might actually play a few holes, but most of the time they're returning to a place that they know pretty well. They've got their books all put together and they're trying to learn what do I have this week? What's, what's my game look like this week? And then how's the ball going to react to it? Um, right. And I understand that they're doing this for millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, who amongst us as amateur golfers wouldn't love to see an improvement, whether it pays off in 50 cent skins or whether it's just you feel better at the end of the day. So doing all of those things is a part of that process, which leads me to ask if there's if it's okay for me to say that there are times when your testing might reveal that you don't need the most expensive ball on the shelf. 100%. And I think, and actually, I would say, I will tell you, and I have access to every golf ball that we make. I play super soft. Like, out of all of my ball testing, I am most confident with it. It doesn't spin as much around the green as other balls for me, but I... I feel most confident standing over that ball, no matter where it is on course. And that allows me to play better and to not, you know, be squirreling the ball all over the place. I'd rather be straight, even if I am, you know, I, my whole thing is I'm playing with golfers in the golf industry who are much better than me. So I want to like keep up with them and I don't want to be chasing, you know, back and forth. I want to confidently be striking the ball, things like that. So for me, that, has meant that I play super soft when I could play crumb soft all day long if yeah. I wanted. Uh, that, by the way, I have a strange question for you, but you know, you're out there playing and you're a Callaway yeah. department head, so to speak. Yeah. Um, what happens if Petra, you know, she's over off to the side, she's looking maybe not for her ball, but for one of her playing partner's balls and she finds a, a pro V, does she just like kick it down the cliff or does she does she put it in the bag and bring it back into the lab to dissect it? Wait, what, what do you do with other brand balls when you come across them? Um, personally, I'm more likely to kick it down the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> um, or, or deposit it in something where people can't find it, maybe. Um, but I, I typically wouldn't, yeah, I don't typically bag it or uh, take it back. If there's something that we're looking to dissect, more often than not, we're looking for new balls to dissect because yeah. once it's out there, I'm not, I don't know where it's been or who's done what to it. So it's hard for me to like make a good analysis um, unless there was something like really, I, I've, I can't think of a single time I've actually bagged a ball because there was something interesting about what I found on course. I'm much more likely to, um, we have joked though over the years, and then this has only happened once. I've only done this actually once, but I had extra balls in my bag and I would just replace it. Like if it was like in a semi findable area, I would just like, you know, pick up the Pro V and like leave a crumb soft and be like, okay, yeah. bummed you missed that ball, you know? <laughs> like, but. Uh, you know, Callaway is our ball sponsor and has been for a number of years. And we have our logos, the ones that you see behind me um, on, the, on the golf balls. Yeah. And we give a lot of them away. That's part of mm -hmm. what we what we do in our partnership, but people will tweet me pictures of my logo golf balls that they have found somewhere and blame me for having hit them there. And, 
you know, on occasion, maybe I did, but most of the time, it's probably something I gave to somebody, but it's kind of yeah. fun to, to get back that, that sort of feedback with look what I found, you know, you know obviously you, you uh, needed multiple takes on the TV shot here, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, you alluded to it a little bit about putting ball in the bag and coming back to, to look into it. Um, yeah. There is a science to all the things we're discussing and it's a kind of a top secret development process where I don't know how many people realize this, but Callaway, their offices in Carlsbad are in an industrial park. They're right around the corner from Titleist, and right around the corner from TaylorMade. So everybody's, your neighbors, your competitors, and you're very careful about guarding your data and your processes and especially for upcoming products, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, um, we would call it trade secrets, right? So things that we would never show on a marketing video or in a tour, we wouldn't explain to people. Um, there's development projects that are always happening. And because we all all are so close when we go out to lunch, you know, like we all will kind of check each other because we naturally, we love what we do. And I think what's interesting is whenever we hire new people on the team, I think they're somewhat surprised to find that like, we'll go out in our group to lunch and we'll talk about other random stuff, but it like kind of always comes back to work because we love what we do. We love talking about it. We're interested. And, and when that happens, you know, sometimes every once in a while, someone will be like, Hey, keep it down. We're like in the middle of like a, you know, outdoor, outdoor lunch area, like, Hey, loud talker, like pipe down over there. We don't want to tell them what we're doing. So, cause you never know who's at the table next to you or like what's, what's going on. And um, yeah, it's, it's very competitive. We want we want to have competitive advantages. We want to have processes and developments that other companies don't have. And that's actually when we're searching for new technology or new partnerships. One of the first things I'm asking is like, what would the, what would it take for us to have exclusive rights to this? Or, you know, for you to not want to share this with every other person in the golf industry. Um, because if we can have exclusivity, that might give us an advantage. Yeah, so. everybody, everybody's searching for that edge, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And also searching for whatever it is that will move the needle to bring more consumers into the product. And of course, yeah. quite often that is player uh, staff endorsement sort of a thing where mm -hmm. whether it's an LPGA or a PGA Tour player, they're playing your product. They've got the logos on the hats, the shirts, the bags, they're playing everything. You know, we watched Xander Schauffele at the at the Masters. We're pulling for him. Still can't understand how he hit that shot on 16. It's going to drive <laughs> him crazy for years. It's going to drive me crazy for years. But part of that discussion then turns to distance because they all hit it so much further than mm. the, the rest of us. Yeah. Um, and, and there's this hand-wringing and there's this anxiety over the distance that a golf ball flies. Uh, I don't happen to have that problem. I would love to be guilty of hitting the ball too far. I'm not. I, nobody's ever looked at me and said, see, that's what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, there's a young man in Japan wearing a green jacket who is far from the longest bomber uh, on the professional men's tour. And mm -hmm. yet he somehow managed to win the Masters in Hideki. Yeah. So when you constantly get bombarded by questions of how far the golf ball flies. What is the Petra Petrich response? Well, I think I, Petra Petrich and Callaway, I think are, we're still developing official stances on this because there's research going into what our opinions are. The USGA put out a, an opinion or a, hey, call to arms. This we're looking to roll back distance. Here are some of our proposals. And then they asked for manufacturers and people interested in the golf industry to provide opinions. So we're in the process of developing opinions and doing that. Callaway is very, um, we want to be data backed in the way that we're developing opinions. We don't want to just like, you know, off the cuff, this is my opinion. But even in their, um, in their report and in the data that they're providing, you'll notice that amateurs, regular golfers from the 1970s to now have not added a significant amount of distance to their game. Professional tour players have, for sure. And that's because they're constantly getting fit. They're using the latest and greatest equipment. They're specializing now in um, working out and building strength. And you know what I mean? They're finding ways to optimize their game. They're looking for ways to one-up their competitors just the way that we are. And um, I think 
what's interesting is, um, so I, the, our senior VP of um, R&D, we were actually just talking about this yesterday, was telling us a story about Javelin that I had never heard, where um, they, back in the day, the Javelin was going so far that it started, you know, approaching the track. So you don't want to like hurt people by throwing the Javelin. So what they did is they actually changed the Javelin. Like they did something, I think they shortened it and they made it heavier is what he said. Don't 100% quote me on this, but this was what I was being told. So they changed the Javelin and that obviously like reduced distance for a period of time, but it was only a number of years before the world record was right back to the distance that it previously had been at. And that's because the athletes that were the best at that sport then hone in on that new Javelin. They're like, okay, how do we throw this? How do we go back to accomplishing the things that we had accomplished? So as the game attempts to roll back in whatever manner, whether that's through golf balls or golf clubs, the best players in the world are always going to make it their mission to then reclose that gap or become better and better and better. For an average player, I don't know that we're ever going to make that up. And so it creates a very interesting conversation around what makes golf fun for people. And you actually mentioned this early on, and it was a discussion we were having internally around, like, would you be upset if you were not playing the exact product that the pro tours people are playing? And one of our, one of our internal engineers said, you know, for him, he enjoys going to Pebble Beach. And if he wanted to, his bag could completely and totally reflect the exact same bag and equipment that whoever pro tour player was, and then he could go play the course. And the thing that I thought was most interesting is he goes, I may never shoot a lower score, but I could shoot a lower score on a single hole that that exact right. same tour player played with his exact same equipment. And forever, I would have that, you know, I, I beat. Hideki Matsuyama on this hole with his equipment and whatever. And you can walk away with that sense of pride. Now, not every person playing the game of golf, myself included, would go out with that set of goals in mind. Like for me, I want to keep up with the people that I'm playing with. I want to enjoy my good time. So I think we have to consider and provide for all of those things. And I think that if there was some sort of rule change, if we ever went down this, the path of bifurcation where, you know, there would be tour players playing particular product and amateurs playing another product. I still think that it's likely that we would provide that tour product to people who want to play the tour product. So that if you yourself wanted to play with equipment that to some extent is going to reduce your distance, you could. There's, um, there's nobody going to do that. Well, yeah, and maybe not, but I'm like, but if, but if you're excited about playing right. equipment to equipment, exactly, you know, I mean, my dad plays forged irons. I'm totally shooting him in the foot here, but he plays forged irons when he really should because he's like, oh, forged irons, like that's what the tour players play. Like, if I'm going to be a real golfer, like I want to do that. I'm like, yeah, some offset and cavity back irons would probably help you out significantly. <laughs> but, you know, I'm like, some people play like that. And my dad loves the game. So if he enjoys playing like that, then great yeah. you know how many uh how many years for you doing this golf ball thing i've i've been at callaway golf for 10 years this sunday believe it or not is there a do they give you some sort of a medallion <laughs> is there a watch is there a day off you know no well, well no um i think at 20 years you get a plaque and a little coin that's got a 20 on it i don't think at 10 i don't think they've got the prizes but um but yeah, I, I've been in golf ball for eight of that 10 years. The first two years I worked in program management on clubs. And then I joined golf ball R&D eight years ago. And remind me of something. I, I'm pretty sure when we first met, I, I learned that you kind of came to all this from rocket science. Um, well, not rocket science. I, I have a chemical engineering degree from UCLA. Um, and so I- um, wait, a wait a second, sorry. Um, UCLA beat my Wolverines recently, oh. and so that's a very sore subject. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to take a moment to have a moment of silence. Okay, we're good. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I know. The the UCLA team, I, my whole family was gathered for, you know, the game against the Zags, and it was one of those moments. I played basketball growing up. Um, and so I'm, it's near and dear to my heart. And literally like we made, you know, made that last second shot. We're all like, yes. And I like checked the clock. Cause I was a point guard, right? Check the clock. And I'm like, there's too much time, you know, and he's down the court and get, and got the shot off. And we were just like, yes, no, 
like, no. not believe, still cannot believe that that shot went in. At the very least, we were deserving of overtime because that was an incredible game to watch. I know. I think one of the announcers said, um, no one lost this game. UCLA ran out of time. And that's what it felt like. It was like, it was so neck and neck. I just, you wanted to get to a point where like, it, it, they both, it felt like they both had gas. Like you wanted to get to a point where it was almost like, okay, one of them lost the gas. Like one of them, like, and it just, no, but you know, no. good for them. And it, it was still a fun, it was a fun run. It was a fun game to watch. Yeah, but. You took out, actually, you took out both of our teams from Michigan. You took out the Spartans and then the Wolverines. So shame on you. Your market share in Michigan may dip a little bit. Because <laughs> I know, but you know, that's, those are, um, I have a friend who's a teacher um, in Los Angeles and the Michigan schools do extremely well with um like the Michigan school system is very, very good for universities versus like California school system. So those are kind of the, the two hot spots. like in terms of his, his LA private school, it's like a lot of students end up in California and a lot of them end up in Michigan. So it's always interesting. Well, Petra, it is always fun talking with you. Thanks for sharing a bit of your knowledge with us. We could go for hours, I think, because yeah. we're just scratching the surface of what you, what you know data-wise and all that. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's a fascinating world. I probably... Uh, should be forthcoming and saying, I, I would probably never pass an essay test on all of the specs that go into golf balls. I do know from a feel standpoint, what I like and what I, what I prefer to play. And of course, I'm like, I mentioned earlier, I'm a triple track Chrome soft guy. And I, I like those lines. I like that, all that stuff. Um, and so keep up the good work and hopefully 21 will match the levels of business and enthusiasm that 2020 did. And one of these days, well, I don't know when. I'm not predicting anymore. I used to try this. One of these days, we're coming back out to Carlsbad, and we'll see you in person. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I would, I would love to see you guys there. And um, thank you so much for having me. 